Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. By the way, we're talking about spiritual coincidences. My uh, Instagram mailbox is getting flooded with everybody writing in their spiritual coincidences. Ah. We say in the in spiritual life nothing happens by coincidence everything is sort of like a delicate arrangement by divine energy and i tell you so many so many interesting stories are coming in if you have an interesting spiritual coincidence so to speak you can write me at my uh, instagram account at ragunath yogi um have in today i'm not going to read any but that- there's a lot a lot of what and, and I think it's important that people write down their spiritual coincidences because when you write them down on a regular basis, you realize this is too good to be true. This can't just happen randomly. Write them down, record them, and you'll realize how magical this world is. Right. You don't seem as excited as I am today, Kostuba. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to interrupt oh, your flow. <laughs> it is. It's great. Uh, um, Okay, I'm closing my curtains here. I think I'm getting whited out. That helps, yeah. All right, I shaved my head and everything's like 10 degrees colder. (laughs) We are in beautiful upstate, um, where are we? The Adirondacks, High Peaks region, where I'm doing a program today. Wow. Lake Placid, High Peaks, we call it the High Peaks region, Lakes Placid. We have about 50 people, I think, up today. And we have a good group about, 10 people here for live live. So let's dive in with these questions, friend. All right. Uh, so I think you, you have a question first. for me. Okay. Yeah, you yeah, So this is from... Uh-oh. Oh, this is me first? No, you're oh, reading you, to you, me oh, first. No, you... you read oh, yeah, the question. I'm reading to you first. That's right. Okay, this is from Krishna Nath... I don't know if it's just me, but Raghunath, you've been, Krishna, not the one. you've been cutting out a bit. Hopefully that won't be a problem moving forward, but uh, go ahead. Can you hear me, Robert? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. okay. Here's Krishna Nathwani's question. Why does it feel like the bad guys always win? Why is it that people who treat other people unjustly get away with it? What if you don't see them? have any, um, uh, is it that we just don't see them get any repercussions? Explain that if you can. <laughs> yeah. And what if we don't see them have any repercussions? So, um, you know, Krishna is a friend of mine. So Krishna, uh, this Krishna is, this is, a, is a female, not a male, but Krishna Natwani is a close friend. So, you know, this, I'm, I'm hearing from Krishna and, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I've spoken with Krishna recently too. So I, I have a, a bit of an understanding where this is coming from. But, uh, you know, it sounds like a cry for justice, you know? Like, it's true. We, like, if we're watching a film or something like that, we want to see the wrongdoers. You know, we, we, we want to, what do they yeah. call that when it has this, the thing comes to this proper closure, a proper conclusion, you know? It feels, it doesn't feel right, you know, until we see justice done. Um, and that's natural. 
but I think, you know, if we're gonna, if we're going to approach this, like if our goal is our own spiritual development, then we really have to become concerned with ourself, you know, and, and, and less concerned about everybody else's their, their, their justice, <laughs> you know, you know, wanting to see, see people go down. And, and, and I get it, you know, like this, this yoga philosophy, an important element is the conception of the law of karma. Uh, that everything is, play, and, and it's kind of like, well, why this person is being such a creep, this person is being such a jerk can't I see them go down and then, and then it'll help me relish in yeah. their demise. <laughs> yeah, right. And so, you know, and we may, but this is the point she asked, uh, why does it seem like the bad guys always win? Krishna, the bad guys don't always win. As a matter of fact, they never win, right? They, never they win. will, they will pay. And, and you know, so they win a battle, they, win a battle. they, they might never win a, win a war. Yeah. So from our very limited perspective, we may have trouble seeing how the whole thing is just and how the law of karma is playing out. But to quote that sage, George Michael, you've got to have faith. <laughs> right? There you yes. go. Uh -huh, you like to have one rubbing on? Yes. <laughs> okay, you got to have faith. Now, the Brahma Samhita, these are the prayers of the most intelligent person with the broadest perspective in the entire universe. And, and there's this beautiful- Not George Michael. Not George Michael. We don't George Michael. Here. We he does have broad intelligence. <laughs> yeah. No, we're I mean, he on. had a beard before anybody had a beard. <laughs> no, Brahma may have had one before him. But um, <laughs> this, is, this is from his Brahma Samhita. Uh, beautiful verses. Yes, Tvendra Gopam at Vendra Maho Svakarma, Bandhan Rupa Palabhajanam at Noti, Karmadi Nirdhati Kintu Chapakti Bhajam. Govindam, Adi Purusham, Tamaham Bajami. Hmm. He says, I adore the primal, the, pri the primal, primeval Lord, Govinda, who burns up to their, to their roots all of the karma of those who are imbued with devotion and impartially ordains for each the due enjoyment of the fruits of one's activities of all of those who walk the path of karma in life in accordance with the chain of their previously performed works, no less in the case of the tiny insect that bears the name Indra Gopa than in that of Indra, the king of the devas. Right? It's so, almost time to explain what an Indra Gopa is. Yeah, well, apparently there's- I don't think they're ready for that yet. But apparently anyways, there's some let's very- take point across first. Well, apparently there's some very tiny insect that's known as the Indra Gopa. I wonder but, if it's like a germ or a bacteria or an atom. Or, or I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But, he, but what he's saying is that I adore Lord Govinda. For, the devo for those that dedicate their life to him, he takes all that bad karma and just burns it up. And for everybody else, everybody that's decided that I'm, I'm not going to devote my life and to reconnect with my divine source, but I'm going to play it out in this world of action and reaction, then he is impartially, um, what, how did it say? Impartially ordains, you know, he's meeting out um, all the karma just right for everyone. No less in, you know, for, for Lord Indra, the king of heaven, than for that tiny little insect, the Indragopa. So, you know, we come across people in our lives and they seem to be doing wrong and we, they seem to be happy and doing well in life. And, and, and we're sitting here saying, when's the karma right. going to set in? What is this? Um, but uh, but it, it comes. It does come. But I, wanna, I really want to take this to like a deeper level. And that is like that we have the faith that everyone's getting their karma. We also from the heart know that this karma is, that the reactions to their actions are meant to help them grow. But what I think we need to be careful, if we want to go deep into spiritual life, not surface stuff, let's go deep. You know, today, most of my answers are going to be kind of cutting, right? I'm going to, I'm going to be cutting today, all right? Because that's I why think, we call you the surgeon. Okay. <laughs> Do we? I never we, knew we, that. Privately, we call him the surgeon. So, so, um, because let's, let's face it, we're, we're getting old. We're, we got to stop like just being on the surface level of spirituality. We need to go deep, right? And that means we have to, it's going to require real introspection. And it's going to mean that we're going to have to let go of a if lot. You're of younger, if you're younger, 
If you're younger, you can stay on the surface, but me and Costuba have to get deep. We, we got it. Yeah, it's you know, time's ticking away. Dead, dead serious. And, and so, like, if we want to get off that surface level of spirituality, it means letting go of a lot of the petty stuff that we hang on to. Now, we tend to think, most everybody, I believe, tends to think that we're good and others are bad, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. We're the good ones. Everyone yeah, else is bad. Is. <laughs> Even if we do something wrong, you know, like we're still good mostly, and, and, but everyone else is bad. We have to try to think, you know what, all of us that are in this big fishbowl of this material world, we're all a mixture, for the most part, we're all a mixture of good and bad, right? And just like we want to see that person get their justice, you know, we have to understand that they're not so different than us, even if they have done some wrong or some bad. We both had these very long histories of good and bad, right? Very long histories of good and bad. And so when we think about karma and we're looking and saying, well, why hasn't karma kicked in? This isn't right. We have to think that, you know, karma, there's karma manifests in different ways. Or karma, there's an unmanifest stage of karma called uprarabdha karma. Right? Uprarabdha. Uprarabdha. It's, I almost sound like Scooby-Doo when I'm trying to talk. Uprarabdha. It's not <laughs> parabdha, it's prarabdha. Yeah, uprarabdha karma means it's sitting there like a seed. We've done an action in the past. Time is between the seed, that, that action itself, and the fructification of that seed into a manifest you know, reality, right? So there's uprarabdha karma, and then there's prarabdha karma, which is the karma that is manifested now, now that it's happened, right? It's occurred. Like I'm going through some pain right now. That's my parabdha karma. That's something yeah. I'm manifesting. And there's something sitting inside me that still hasn't blossomed yet. That's my uprarabdha karma. And, the, and in our uprarabdha karma, it may manifest the next minute. It may manifest the next year. It may manifest the next lifetime. We don't know. And that point is so important, you know, because sometimes, you know, our, our skeptical minds or maybe even skeptical isn't the right term, but like our, you know, we, we do have to judge things and consider things. So when we, to me, understanding karma is kind of like, it was essential for like all the pieces of the puzzle coming together of what's going on in this world, you know, what's going on in this universe. It, it takes all the spiritual ideas and then it just sews them right together when you understand karma. But some people, when they hear about karma, they get worried of where it may go, right? Because like, say, say I'm born, you know, wealthy or if I'm born good looking or if I'm born, you know, and then if someone else is born blind or poor, does it mean that the wealthy, good looking person is just a better person, a person that's more good than another? Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is it, that's parabdha karma. But there's also uprabdha karma. There's a karma that we don't know. The blind person may be born beautiful and wealthy the next life. And the, and, and the wealthy, beautiful person may be born as an Indragopa insect in the next birth. We don't know, right? So we, don't, we should move through life not judging people based on any external like that, but understanding that we're all going through good and bad karma based on a long history of activities that are behind a screen that we're not aware of, right? Right. And, and so when, some, when we see someone doing wrong, particularly they've done it to us, and we're sitting there waiting for them to get their just desserts, right? To get their, to, if we want to go deep into spirituality, we should understand, you know what? I also have a lot of just desserts coming my way too. And just as this person's, even the fact that, I, I feel offended or mistreated by this person. If I'm going to think deeply, mustn't I have done something like that in the past? Isn't that why I'm experiencing this? And, and so what good, what, what good will come from me bearing any animosity towards this person? Um, and, and this is super important right here, that there's going to be no joy at the end of this when that person gets their just desserts, right? Don't think that, oh, I'm going to feel so good when I see that person go down. Because if that's where we're finding our joy in life, it's going to be a miserable life, right? It's going to be a miserable life. We, we have to come to that point where we wish everyone well. And we're really getting deep into spirituality when even if someone's causing us harm 
and, and again, always have to give like the side note, this isn't saying accept abuse and all that kind of stuff, but what it's saying is passing through life, wishing everyone well, right? We, we need to come to that stage if we're gonna go deep into spirituality. So Krishna, have faith. Um, karma does work, bad guys don't win. Everyone gets their karma. Um, we're all a mixture of good and bad for the most part. Um, and don't worry about it, focus on yourself. Focus on yourself, elevating your behavior, elevating your consciousness. Let go of resentments, right? And, and, and only in that state of mind will we be able to go deep into spirituality. All right. Good answer. Good answer. To the right. family feud. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> okay, Raghunath, now you're up next. You ready? <laughs> good answer. Good answer. We should all do that. Let's do this. Good answer. Mom. Okay. Why? Okay. Oh, we got someone's got a. Uh, he put the shell on the chair. There we go. We got um, they mute him up. He was got unmuted somehow. Oh, okay. We got the kid in the back seat. Okay. Right. So you ready, Rogo? I'm ready. Okay. Hit me with your best shot. Be, Come on, Eddie. Hit me with your best shot. Wouldn't be sleeping Saturday without a little Pat Benatar reference. Okay. <laughs> um, coming from Jorgen from the Netherlands via Jorgen. Yeah. From the Netherlands. We're getting quite, Krishna Natwani, she's from originally from London, but now she's living in New Orleans. This is coming from Jorgen, who is living in the Netherlands. Through Raghunath Span's shelter, youth of, and youth of today, I came to hear, I came to hear your show. The interview with Parmananda was the first show I watched. Okay. Remember when we did that one? It was a good one. It was yeah. a good one. So I still have a lot of catching up to do. But this question isn't about hardcore, but about, as Raghunath often refers to, upgrading your life. Yes. Songs like Slow Down, Better Way, and Appreciation got me really thinking about my own life. Those are Raghunath songs from, are those all shelter songs? or some No, of they're those? both shelter and youth today. What, what is Slow Down? How does that one go? I bet it's a really fast song. It was written in 1987. It was super fast. It goes, uh, lost the time to live, no time to take, caught in a cycle that won't give you a break. Tension's running high. I can see it in your eyes. You call that success? I call it a lie. Slow down. Oh, slow down. Slow down. But that song was probably slow like less about- I want to see all of this world, what this world has to offer me. Take a break and appreciate before this life just slips away. Slow down. Part of his generation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In this age of Kali, where yeah, corruption... I've got to take that song more seriously now. I know, right? Slow down, Ruga. Slow down. Yeah. In this age of Kali, where, co where corruption, greed, and so on reigns, is not... In this age of Kali, where corruption, greed, and so on reigns, is not really the place I feel so at home. Gotcha. So I started to slow down yeah. a bit and reflect on the things that matter to me. Appreciate more and try to be more gotcha. gentle. But Maya is always around the corner. Illusion, right? <laughs> Bewilderment. To cut it short, I began to try meditation a while ago. But how will I do this the right way? Should I listen to Kirtan? I often use Janavi or Krishnadas. Or should I chant the Maha Mantra or even be silent? Could you please give me some insight on this matter? Any advice? will be hugely appreciated. Good question. Good, great question. Taking it to the next uh, level. Yeah. You know, um, because we have habits and our senses oftentimes haven't been trained in like spiritual discipline, sometimes they're trained in a material discipline. They just need to be regulated for spiritual disciplines. And regulate, and this is why there are malas, 108 beads, on a on a on a like a garland. They call it a mala means like a garland, and so it's 108 beads on this garland, and and, and it's really just to keep count. Um, and by keeping a particular count, it like it locks me into a certain commitment of time per day. So by chanting a regulated amount of maha mantra on your beads, I'm going to chant one round a day every day. And we always say like, it's in that explicit commitment that we, we, we actually change our life. 
It can even be something material. It can be like uh, going to the gym. You know, it, it's an explicit commitment. I don't go to the gym when I feel like going to the gym. I go even when I don't feel like going to the gym. By the way, I don't go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's no clue. <laughs> You guys are like, no kidding. <laughs> but anyway, the idea is that explicit commitments change our lives. Implicit commitments, there's no change. We don't say, I'm going to start going to the gym. That doesn't work well. I'm going to start my yoga practice this year. Explicitly, I'm going to start practicing yoga three days a week for an hour and a half a day, you know, for the rest of the year. That, that, when we make those things written in sand, Written in stone, not sand. <laughs> Written in stone. That's when we actually. That's start. why it hasn't been working. We've been writing it in <laughs> sand all along. <laughs> right in sand. The tide comes in and changes it. So this is interesting because all these self-help books and goal-setting books say this, but this is the philosophy behind our spiritual life as well. It's called sadhana bhakti. Sadhana bhakti means, and we've been talking about this regularly, the guru gives some prescribed amount of discipline. We regulate our senses and we regulate our meditation. And so we say, we, with the, if, you have, if you have malas, you can make malas. You can make them out of a, sh a, a shoelace. I've made them before when I couldn't find my beads. But you make 108 uh, little knots in, those, in a rope where you have 108 beads and you, and, you, and you give your mind to meditation on that transcendental sound. And you make a commitment, do it every day. And then, and, and, um, as far as like listening to kirtan, yeah, that could, I I use kirtan as a as a um, soundtrack to whatever I'm doing in life, you know. So if I'm driving somewhere, I put on kirtan, or if I'm cooking something, I put on kirtan, and it has an effect. It has a lifting effect on everything I do, and also it just stays in your mind. And what's happening is it's a slow cleansing of the mind. In the same way, if I had a glass of gasoline now, how do you get rid of that gasoline well if i if i was to put that gasoline this is not good for the environment but just hear me out it's an analogy under a waterfall i'm not really getting rid of the gasoline i'm just adding the water i'm not thinking about getting rid of the gasoline i'm just thinking about i want water and to the degree that i keep it in that waterfall eventually i have nothing left but spring water the practice of bhakti is not so we're not waving the flags of renunciation so much. We are saying add bhakti. And by adding fresh, clean, you know, nourishing superfood of sound, we start to transform everything that we do. And you'll notice that you start getting redirected almost instinctually. Your choices change. Like, so, uh, like Steve Decimo was saying yesterday, he's like, I was watching Blade Runner. And then all of a sudden I thought, why am I watching this? What, what? We start to think like this. We start to notice in the same way when people get into their diet, they start to think, oh man, I can't eat this fried food. I can't eat this. I can't eat that. We start to say, what am I doing with my downtime? Uh, vegan truckers here today. He was saying, I don't listen to those things anymore. I don't watch those things anymore. Because after a while, we start to refine everything that we're consuming because we are what we consume with all our senses and we're creating tomorrow's body right now. So yeah, just add, don't think about giving up necessarily. And then all of a sudden we'll add and, and hear. So add Japa and hear. If you like wisdom of the sages, hear it on a regular basis. It'll start to change you because not because, not because I'm so empowered, but it's because these, the, the sacred texts are so empowered and they need to be heard and discussed on a regular basis. Why? Because they recalibrate our direction and how we move and our choices in this world. And that's what creates us. Thank you. Thank you, Rubio. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Okay. <laughs> Woo -hoo. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. So he should, you recommend that he chant Maha Mantra. Yes. I recommend him chanting Maha Mantra, add it to his life. Okay. You Move know, if you feel like, if a person like me, yeah, yeah. A person like me who talks a lot, silent meditation with like, I mean, like like silence, Mona Vrata, you know, going away to those Vipassana retreats. My wife says my head will explode. Hmm. 
Um, but I think it's important to uh, engage the speaking process in transcendental topics. Beautiful. Okay. You got one for me? Yes, I do, sir. This is from Tom. Tom Sibley. He's one of the others. Also, also, he's a he's an exclusive other. He's a Californian. Right. We have Californian others. They're a whole nother case in themselves because the Californians are really interested in getting onto the show at 5 a.m. because the time difference they can't get on. So they have, they're forced to be others. I've been listening to the podcast every day since February, and I'm pretty sure I bought a Krishna beads from Raghunath at a baby Gopal show in Musick, Pennsylvania, back in the 90s. You remember that, Rogan? Yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> I remember the exchange. He gave me a five and I gave him a single back. <laughs> my wife and I are currently having a baby girl in November and I already love her. I love my wife. I love our dog, Pepper. I used to have a dog named Pepper. Another Krishna coincidence! <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I still have a dog named Pepper. To me, they are all the ultimate gifts of God, and I'm so grateful. I get, to be, I, I get to be the one that is of service to them. If we are to see Krishna in every soul, how could I not be attached to them? Outside of a prayer and, prayer and chanting, they are the ultimate examples of God's love for me and my love, and my love for God. They are essentially how I practice service to God by being of service to them. Because they are the ones I'm around the most. And, uh, no, because they're the ones I'm around the most. And once our daughter is born, it's going to be 24 hour sleepless service festival for, this, for the foreseeable future. Well, it gets worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> he's read the books. <laughs> no, he's got some kids already though. Oh, he's got kids right. Okay, sorry. He gets, he gets it. He gets it. How could I ever look at them and think? Oh, no, maybe he doesn't. Really maybe he doesn't. Family. I'm sorry. Maybe he doesn't. So, yeah. They aren't really my family. I've had many families. My only family is Krishna. <laughs> is, is that what Krishna wants us to see? Why the heck would he want that when Krishna has given us such a beautiful family? I struggle with this non-attachment. It sometimes feels like a callous way to avoid pain. If you aren't attached to anything but God, then nothing can hurt you. But if God is in every living being, how could you not feel some sort of attachment to your nearest and dearest? What would there be to learn in this life without them? Great question. Hey, Great question. question. Tom Sibley. So let me begin by congratulating Tom on the upcoming birth of his daughter. Oh, yes. And, uh, and I hope I get to meet Pepper someday. But now I'm going to cut. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe Pepper maybe Pepper is reincarnated. It's possible into his Pepper. Your Pepper. It's possible. Um, so so you know this is there's always a balance, right? There's always two sides, and this is what 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 Tom is saying is it's giving, in my sense, a clear you know understanding, but from one side of the picture. Bhagavatam is going to help us balance this whole thing out. And again, just like in the last question, Bhagavatam is going to help us zoom out and see this thing from another perspective. So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with loving your family. And the Bhagavatam is not trying to get you to stop loving your family. The practice of bhakti or the practice of yoga is not trying to get you to stop loving your family. Uh, well, certainly the practice of bhakti isn't, <laughs> right? And so, but one thing that's so unique about bhakti yoga is that um, at the heart of it, it's about one sentiment. It's, it's not about renunciation, which like say jnana yoga will appear to be about, but it's really about, um, well, it doesn't deny our emotions. It's really all about uncovering the, the softest, sweetest emotions, right? Look, we're not smiling over there. He likes that. Um, yeah, <laughs> but at the same time, that sentiment, if it's going to be truth, if it's going to be real and substantial, it needs to be balanced with knowledge, with jnana, or with philosophy. You know, like I think it was Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur that may have coined it, I'm not sure, but he said that he was speaking about the balance between religion and philosophy. Right? Yeah. And he would say that religion 
without philosophy is mere sentiment. Religion and, without let's, let's 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 it's such a great statement. Let's just yeah. like put this one out there. Religion right. without philosophy. So that's people like like me. I was born into a religious family. I'm just like, and you just have some sentiment. Yeah. Now, is that a bad thing? Yeah. It's not a bad thing, but it, it can be if it's merely sentiment. Right. Then it's not it's not going to be so powerful or effective or even like situate you in truth. It has to be balanced with philosophy. They he would say philosophy without religion is just mere speculation. Right. That's a great one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you like that? Okay, I'm glad you like, I'm glad I liked this one the first time we heard it. He, he's been... Well, you know, we've heard this, if you've been around the devotees yeah. for a long time, you've heard this statement, but if you think about all the people studying philosophy, especially in the West, how many times, Kostu, have you said, I wish these guys would just read the Bhagavad Gita? Right. It would answer all their questions. They're just like lost in their mind, yeah. thinking, well, what if this? Or this? Or it could be this. Yeah. So say that again. Religion philosophy. without philosophy is mere yeah. sentiment. Philosophy without religion is mere speculation, a dry speculation. You can say. Now, in a similar way, I think we're talking about here, sentiment on one side, pure, loving kind of sentiment. Mm-hmm. Even here, he's using the word attachment, right? Like say attachment to one's family. Um, love for one's family, sentiment. And then that needs to be balanced with knowledge or with truth, you know, like it, 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 otherwise one will get lost. One will take that which is temporary as being permanent. One will limit, and this is where it gets real important, limit the scope of their love, right? Now I'm gonna focus in on three things that, that Tom mentioned here. He said, he mentioned, if we are to see Krishna in every living soul, how could I not be attached to them? Right? How could, speaking of his family, right? If, if Krishna is in every living soul, how could I not be attached to them? Fine, very good, I agree with you. But then using the same logic that you're using, well, Krishna is not just in the heart of your family, Krishna is in the heart of every living being. So then why aren't you attached to every living being? Why aren't you feeling the same kind of sentiments for every living being? You're the surgeon today, man. I'm cutting today. I, You're the Tom, surgeon. I'm just, Tom, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you and your love for your family. I'm not trying, again, I want to encourage that, but I just want to try to expand things now, right? So you, again, you said, if we, if we are to see Krishna in every living soul, how could I not be attached to my family? Okay, but then how could you not be attached to every living soul, right? And, and it's not uncommon that our exclusive love for our family limits our love for others unless and until that love is in relation to God, connected to God, through God. Mm-hmm. That's when things change. Like say you have a husband and wife. Now most people listening are just hearing the audio, they're not seeing the video, but I got like two hands up, you know, you got a husband and you got a wife. And they're focused on each other and they have their love for each other, their affection, their sentiment for each other. But time is going to wear that away until they're separated. At a certain point, they'll be separated, you know? Yeah. And, and their sentiments for each other may be very nice and beautiful, but until they're fully purified, you know, even they're gonna have conflict, you know? But if the two of them are focused together, facing the direction of God, moving in that direction together, not looking to each other for, for the fulfillment in life, but together looking to God for the fulfillment, then you actually have an equation that, that works, that time doesn't destroy, right? That, that no material um, elements get in the way of. And that's what Bhagavatam is calling us to do. And then it's saying broaden that and recognize that every living entity is meant to be centered around that divine center, just like leaves around the root of a tree, right? Now, now another thing that, um, that Tom shared was, he says, I struggle with this non-attachment the idea of non-attachment in yoga circles. And believe me, in bhakti yoga, it's much softer than say like in jnana yoga, where it's like really stark and, you know. He says, I struggle with this non-attachment. It sometimes feels like a callous way to avoid pain. If you aren't attached to anything but God, then nothing can hurt you, it would seem. So I'm gonna suggest to Tom that, okay, that's one way of looking at it, but try to broaden that, try to understand that there's something much more to it than that. And I'm going to get to it. That that's not really what it's about. It's not about avoiding material pain. There's, it's meant 
that we need to see things very clearly, not lose our loving sentiment for our family, but expand that love. All right. And then the third point that he said was, how could I ever look at them and think they aren't my real family? I've had many families. My only family is Krishna. Is that what Krishna wants? Why the heck would he want that when Krishna has given me such a beautiful family? Well, let's think about that. Why has Krishna given you such a beautiful family? Now, one answer to that would be, he's given us our beautiful families because we've, we've desired to enjoy love separately from him, right? Just like we were speaking yesterday about how, how, um, how little Rooney wants to drive a tractor when he sees you drive the tractor, so you give him a, an artificial tractor, right? So I want to love, I want to experience love, but God, I don't want you in the picture. Okay, well, here's a beautiful family for you to love, right? But in the end, time is going to come in and, and break that up, and that's reality. So Bhagavatam's trying to help us say, don't, it's not that you don't love your family, but that you expand it and that you circle it or you, you, you put it around Krishna. So, so this is the point. He doesn't want you not to love your family, but he's simultaneously calling you to expand that love. And if you simply get lost in your family due to your DNA attachment, due to your physical connection, you know, due to, due to temporary things, you, if you limit it, then you're not reaching your full potential. Uh, and you'll go through a cycle of doing that again and again. And the fact is, according to yogic texts, that we have been doing that. We have a family in one life and we have a family in another life and we have another family in another life. And each time we're thinking that family's everything. And we even in different species, right? We, we're going through this. Now, now I'm gonna read something. These are my, these are my ducklings. These, these are, are my, my baby. They, these are my cubs. They, Get yeah. away from my cubs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so now, now this is, this is um, from Srila Prabhupada. I'm going to read something, and, and I think this will help. And, and, and this is Srila Prabhupada's preface to the book, The Nectar of Devotion, okay, which is a book that teaches real beautiful teachings on bhakti yoga and connecting with Krishna. And it's going to keep saying Krishna, but we could just, you could just say God there if you want. You know, it's the same thing. He says, the basic principle of the living condition is that we have a general propensity to love someone. No one can live without loving someone else. This propensity is present in every living being. Even an animal like a tiger has this loving propensity, at least in a dormant stage. And it is certainly present in the human beings. The missing point, however, is where to repose our love so that everyone can become happy. At the present moment, the human society teaches one to love his country or family or his personal self. But there is no information where to repose the loving propensity so that everyone can become happy. That missing point is Krishna, is God. And the nectar devotion teaches us how to stimulate our original love, our original love, not a love that's gone through all these different cycles and it switches from this family to that family to that family over the course of time. The, he says, the missing point is Krishna and the nectar devotion teaches us how to stimulate our original love for Krishna and how to be situated in that position where we can enjoy our blissful life. The nectar devotion teaches us the science of loving every one of the living entities perfectly by the easy method of loving Krishna. We have failed to create peace and harmony in human society, even by such great attempts as the United Nations, because we do not know the right method. Now, this is really good. He says, the method is very simple, but one has to understand it with a cool head. All right, not with an emotional head, <laughs> with a cool head. The nectar devotion teaches all people how to perform the simple and natural method of loving Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, if we learn how to love Krishna, then it is very easy to immediately and simultaneously love every living being. Now he gives a couple of analogies. It is like pouring water on the root of a tree or supplying food to one's stomach. The method of pouring water on the root of a tree or supplying food to the stomach is universally scientific and practical as every one of us has experienced. Everyone knows well 
that when we eat something, or in other words, when we put food in the stomach, the energy created by such action is immediately distributed throughout the whole body. Similarly, when we pour water on the root, the energy thus created is immediately distributed throughout the entirety of even the largest tree. It is not possible to water the tree part by part, nor is it possible to feed the different parts of the body separately. Now, this is where Prabhupada concludes. This is really, he says the nectar devotion, you could say the practice of bhakti, will teach us how to turn the one switch that will immediately brighten everything everywhere. One who does not know this method is missing the point of life. Okay. Yeah. So, so I oh, uh, dropped the mic. That was such a, boom. that, that was a great, uh, <laughs> great excerpt there. Right. So, so that was it's, a great excerpt. It's That's not an extra devotion. Give us a preface. Page. Give it's, a page number. it's from the preface. preface. Yeah. And so they do not know where to read. Pose their love. Yeah, so, that's, that's the point. If, if, if my attachment to my family, my family, born from my body, right, in my house, you know, that look like me, et cetera, if, if, we, if we only relish that sentiment, but we don't bounce it with the philosophy that each one of us is a separate living being, all moving through this ocean. Sometimes it's bringing us together and sometimes the waves pull us apart and then we go through the same thing again and again. And if we, if we, we could get lost and we commonly do get lost in limiting our, our love and our affection for our family. And it's a powerful force in nature. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be balanced with some, sometimes so, so, just like there's the sweet, sometimes we need just a little bit of that bitter truth, right? That, and that one can look at their family, and if one's going to even love their family in truth, in the deepest way, you actually have to be able to look at your family and say, they're not mine. They're God's, right? Now, that doesn't mean that's limited your, your love for them in any way, but it's, now it's love based on truth. And then that truth should expand, and that love should expand, because when, again, because here's the formula, you have to water the root, you have to feed the stomach. And if we can learn to repose that love in the, in the root of all existence, in the source of our existence, in God, then what Prabhupada is saying is, is naturally, easily, we'll love every living being. You know, we love our kid even though, like, the, the, even despite their faults, right? The mother loves the child even though there's so many bad qualities that everybody can see. We need to have that love for every living being. And we see that in the true saints, right? That, that even people with all kinds of fault they, they don't see that they see the good in you always and and that's only going to come when we when we bring some of that philosophical truth into our love for family friends nation whatever it may be it, it needs to be balanced so um I, I guess that's my answer uh again bhakti is not at all calling you to to not love your family <laughs> for sure but it's calling you to expand that love through truth and through focusing everything on the root of all existence, God. All right. Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is what Live Live says today. They're saying, woo. All, all right. right. Thank you, Live Live. All right. Okay. Rob, are you ready? Yes. This, for the second week. Hey, well, you know, we don't have any Harshal Gore question. This He sent one in. Maybe we'll get to it next week. Yeah, no Harshal. But we have Iskra for the second week in a row. Ooh. Iskra writing in from Venezuela. We have fa we play favorites on the show here. <laughs> Iskra really and favorite. Harshal Gore are two of our favorites. Well, only this, is, this is the second one from Iskra. She mm -hmm. says, my question this time is about chanting. Now, this is another one about chanting for you, Ravana. Mm -hmm. As you already know, I have been an Ashtanga yoga practitioner for several years. And even though we open and close our practice every day by chanting two specific mantras, the Vande Guru Nam, you know that one? Vande Guru Nam Charanara Vinde. Then Abahu Parashakaram, Shankar Chakra. Okay. So, yeah, so one's for the guru and one is and one is for Patanjali. Yeah. And then there's the and, and they, they, they yeah, it's okay. And the Mangala Mantra, they chant those. Uh, but they say besides that we chant very little about the rest. For my part, I have always liked to chant mantras and do japa, but I have very little formal guidance in this regard. I regularly chant to Sri Ganesha, some Vedic mantras that resonate with me, and the Hanuman Chalisa, which fills me with a lot of devotion. I was chanting with Eddie Stern for five months until recently, every day at 6 a.m., 
the, uh, to Sri Ganesha and Lord Vishnu. And this finally created a habit in me. I've been listening to you for about three months and I have the desire to continue deepening this practice of chanting, but I don't know how to do it according to bhakti. Could you talk a bit about this? What mantras or chants to start with? What time to do it for how long? Are there any guidelines on this that I can study? Where? Great question, Iskra. Super good question. And yes, there are with all those things. Matter of fact, you'll read um, all over Vedic texts that mantras have to be given to you. you. We don't choose them because we like the sound or calling. They have to actually, to be effective, they must be given. Because, and part of the truth is that, um, that the, the teacher imports the purport of the mantra and they explain, and also that mantra has to be given in disciplic succession. We can't just say, well, my teacher randomly picked it and now she's randomly giving it to me. It, it, these mantras come down through lineages and the lineages explain the purport and therefore the mantras become more powerful. So yeah, there is a, a few things. One is the mood of when you chant. So we always recommend in our lineage, we recommend the Maha Mantra, Maha, mean, Maha means great. And um, the mood of the mantra is not for a thing. There's many mantras for things. Do you know that? There's Lakshmi mantras, fertility mantras, you know, mantras for uh, healing mantras. And they all have their efficacy, you know, but the Maha Mantra doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you need. That's a scary mantra, right? Because <laughs> I want a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff I need that I don't want. <laughs> hey, right. Right. So um, the Maha Mantra is very powerful. For those who are just like, I'm on a spiritual path and this is what I want. Although they say, and we were just reading that the other day in class, Akama Sarvo Kamo Va, even if you do have material desires, just chant the Maha Mantra. So the Bhagavatam itself is saying this. You just approach Krishna in that mood. Oh, Krishna. And that is our mood when we chant the mantra. The mantra. That's my, my mood when I put out there is, Krishna, what do you got for me? Whatever you got, I trust. You're the director. You're the captain of the ship. You give me what you want today. And I'm going to accept that as a blessing. And that's why even these Vedic astrologers that people go to on a regular basis, and I love them too, there is something happening in your life that you can't, that you're hitting your head against the wall. Maybe it's health, maybe it's finance. So the astrologer says, you need to worship Ganesh. You need to wear a diamond. You should not wear blue sapphires, whatever it is. You should get a particular jewel. To, there's a malefic planet. But for people really practicing bhakti, oftentimes they accept what I got, I got. And that's Krishna's mercy. And my only work is to figure that out. This is Krishna's mercy. Krishna, what do you got for me? I fully trust my life is in divine hands, whatever I'm getting dealt with today. And once you fully accept that, that is the dawn of liberation. Then you realize, oh, my life is fully in God's hands today. And he just wants to, God, Lord Krishna, sweet baby Krishna, just wants me to figure out why I'm getting this done and how I'm gonna use this particular situation to upgrade my life. That comes in different ways. So that's our mood. Krishna, what do you got for me today? I'm here at your service. That's the mood of the mantra when we chant the Maha Mantra. Then we talked about earlier about regulation. Every day, check in with that regulation. And yes, there are rules of the mantra as well um, in order for it to be effective. Um, uh, and, and these rules were taught by uh, Sri Chaitanya, who really, they're always there but he really emphasized them and really pushed them the first one is and this will cripple you in your spiritual path is we stop criticizing other people we take the microscope over everybody else's problems in the world i mean we even have this in western psychology right or you know go you, you go to your therapist yeah my husband's like this or my wife's like this and she's driving me crazy and he had an affair on me blah 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 it generally, a good therapist will take, will, will go to you, well, what's your responsibility in this, right? A good therapist will flip it around on you. In the same sense, we put our focus on how I can improve. And I find even in my life, 
without even hearing this, I find in my life, when I decide I'm gonna change something about my life, that will have a ripple effect with everybody in my universe. When I start to change, things start to change. Things don't change, we must change, to quote Shelter. Um, uh, <laughs> so you did it again. Beautiful shelter lyric right there. Have a shelter. It's all. It's all the shelter. It's all. It's all I put, there. I put all my teachings in my lyrics. So you just. You just <laughs> these CDs will last ten thousand years. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so that that it, that that is one important rule, and the problem is. We grow up criticizing. I grew up being a sarcastic, snarky, critical little punk. And that is a habit. And I cannot take those habits into sacred circles or you're going to destroy your spiritual life. Criticizing people who practice spiritual life is like a death knell for my spiritual growth. You like that? Death knell? Death knell. Uh, but just to... Look, Mara's the, smiling. She's like making batter and she's smiling. Yeah, no. <laughs> I love that. So, but now I also want, because Iskra seems to be asking like, are there any particular chants? All that you've shared is like essential information, but do okay. you recommend any particular mantras and when to do it and for how long and that kind of thing? Okay, please hold, surgeon. We're getting right. there. We right. also train ourselves to see good in other people. We are incredibly tolerant. There's another thing, we're incredibly tolerant and we don't practice Tolerance goes hands to hands with resentment. I'm tolerant of things and, I, and I, I don't practice. I say practice resentment because resentment is something you can practice and you can get, get really good at it. And you can, keep whole, you can keep file cabinets of records of others' wrongs. You just carry them with you. Oh yeah? How about last year when you did this to me, Kastuba? Right? Yeah, I you didn't do anything. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but- you can practice them and you can start to look for um, ways you've been hurt. And we carry that around in heavy file cabinets on our back and it, it cripples your spiritual life. So these are, these are important. They seem like sort of like they're super important to follow according to Sri Chaitanya on your spiritual life. Rid yourself of these resentments as best as you can. Stop criticizing immediately, become tolerant. Don't look around, be like a hound dog looking for praise from other people. Um, as far as, uh, and I'd say make a commitment, an explicit commitment. You know, everybody on Zoom, you should all be chanting one round a day. Mara, new rule. Don't give out those secret codes unless they're chanting out one round a day. You cannot get on Zoom. If you're already in your grandfathered in, but I want you to one round a day. <laughs> and a neck tattoo? What's that? And a neck yeah, you need a, neck, you need a neck tattoo of one of our famous hashtags, and then you need to chant one round a day. Then you get the secret codes. Uh, so, um, but chan making an explicit commitment radically starts to change you. And, um, and you can chant anytime. There's no rules about when to chant. It's always best early in the morning. It's like your first food of the day right? They baked us a chocolate cake yesterday. Vegan chocolate cake. I woke up. It was looking me right in the face. <laughs> Have a bite, Ragu. It's good. You got a heavy day in front of you today. You need some nourishment. Cacao is a super food. <laughs> Sean Murphy gave me some vegan dark chocolate peanut butter cups as a gift. I didn't eat anything. I just said, no, 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 no. My first food is going to be the Maha Mantra today. And then I just talked nonsense with Sean Murphy all morning. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, first thing in the morning, good time to chant. It's nice in your house if you have a little private place, your sitting place, you know, where you sit, where you have a little, an altar. Uh, uh, and sometimes it's depending where we live. We might live with a million people. We might live alone. If you live alone, it's easy. You make your whole house your temple. You know, we have a closet in our house, a sacred closet. It's a big closet. We go in, we have an altar. Me and the kids set up our altar there, and that's our sacred spot. Did that answer all the questions? I uh, no, you still haven't told her what to chant. I mean, Mahamantra is there, but I think she was looking for some like Vedic chants that are very bhakti related. 
Oh, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to lean on the Maha Mantra okay. because it's the Maha Mantra. It's the Maha of all mantras. Now, from that, there's so many other things I like to chant as well. But, but first, do the essential. First and foremost. And then add on that. I mean, me and the kids will chant the Ganga Stotram, the Yumunasticum, you know, the Nishringa Kavacha, the, you know, the Hanuman Chalice. They're, they're all like, first, you got to put the gas in the car. Okay. And then you can start to like, you know, uh, polish the car, clean the car, check the, you know, you know, get the cool rims for your car, whatever it is. But you got to have gas in the car. And that gas so the, is the Maha Mantra. Gas is the Maha Mantra. It's okay. the, it's the, it's the powerful mantra of like deliverance for the consciousness and for the mind, especially in this crazy age we live in. And it's, it's a mantra that is not asking for anything. It's give me what I ask. That's why when you chant the Maha Mantra, it doesn't necessarily give you peace. It might even stir stuff up. Why? Because that's the, st right? When I move the couch, I see there's so much stuff under the couch. If you have kids, so much stuff is under that couch. There's like a, a sandwich under the couch. Like there's stuff under the couch. So when we use that Maha Mantra, we are moving the couch and we're doing the deep cleaning. Mm. We're not just, eh, we'll just keep it, it's pretty good. We don't want pretty good. We want the deep cleaning. The Maha Mantra is going for the deep cleaning. Okay, but I'm gonna suggest one thing for Iskra, because I think she wants something. What do you, what do you, you got something I'm gonna say Brahma okay. Samhita, right? If you get the book, the Brahma Samhita, um, and we can share a link for that. And, uh, and, you ch and you learn, I mean, you can learn the whole thing, but let's say text 29 through 38, that's 10 verses. Very beautiful, right? You know that stuff, right, Rogu? I chanted the them. This is shelter lyrics, the song of Brahma. The song of Brahma. I chanted them on my deathbed. Chintamani prakara sadma sukalpa viksha laksha vrteshu surabhira bipala yantam lakshmi sahasra shata sabrama sevya manam govinda mari purusham tamaham bajami. Beautiful verses. Beautiful, They're so fun nice. to learn. Yeah. So that's a good one to, I, I, I think that would satisfy her, her desire for Vedic chanting in a very Krishna centered way. Maybe we should post a link, a post yeah. a link that on the, on the thread. I mean, you can find it, I'm sure on YouTube, people chanting it and. All right. All right. That was good. Was, good answer. Good answer. I, wait, I'm not allowed to say that was good about my own answer. <laughs> good answer. That was good. Okay. The studio audience says that was good. There we go. Okay. So I have to get out in. 10 minutes. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, we'll do it 10 minutes. Over sometimes, but I have to because we have a class going. Okay. Got, then uh, quick, hit me with your best shot. Kids. Okay. Laura Rubino, one of our faves, is here asking a question. Kustubaji. Mm -hmm. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it states that we should rid ourselves of material desires and only have the desire to serve Krishna and return back to Krishna, back to Godhead. I have an extremely intense longing to leave my body and go back to Krishna. That's good. So I'm slow down. There. <laughs> okay. Even though I'm not worthy of his of his love. Oh, come on. Yes, you are. I pray he has mercy on my soul. I meditate upon returning and dancing with Krishna in the forest, amongst other pastimes mentioned in Vedic texts. That's the meditation. That's the desire. She's got her head on straight. When I express these desires to others, <laughs> it can sound quite morbid or even suicidal. Oh, I, I thought she was, when you express to others, like, I want to go dancing with Krishna in the forests. I think that's what she's talking about. Yeah, I know, but, uh, but she was saying, I want to die and do that. So that I could mean, sound folks. morbid and suicidal. Yeah, right, right. Um, However, this is not the case. I simply want to hear Krishna's flute play once again. I have learned in bhakti yoga to simply take what we do and spiritualize it. Is there any higher desire? Is my intense longing a healthy spiritual desire or can this desire be taken too far? All right, Laura Rubino, we love her. She's a regular hey. teacher also on our Patreon account too. Yeah. So that desire, uh, Lord, that, that can take, it, it doesn't take it too far. It takes you all the way back to Goloka Vrindavan where those pastimes are taking place. So that's, it takes you right where you want to go. But um, I have a couple things to share. 
that one is that when you try to share the esoteric side of bhakti to someone who's unfamiliar with it, they're not going to get it, right? They're probably not going to get it unless you really have time to lay everything out and explain it very clearly. And even then they may not get it. So there's certain, I'm sorry. I worship Tulsi, Tulsi's a goddess. I walk around here and I burn away my sins. So that I can be born into a female what? form and be a maidservant eternally. You know, the, 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 these things are hard to, they need to be. It's beautiful, but it's, yeah. <laughs> so, so there are things that we can explain, like to say, say something like, you know, um, even something like, you know, I wish to really reconnect in love with God, that, that's the kind of thing that someone might be able to understand. But to say that I desire to dance, you know, in, in the sacred dance in the spiritual realm beyond this, you know, it's, it's that kind of stuff most people aren't going to get. What to speak of if you frame it in terms of I just want to leave my body and go there, you know, it, people will misunderstand it. So try to always keep in mind when you're explaining uh, Bhakti to people, try to take, take into account what the what they'll be able to understand. Um, otherwise they will misunderstand. So that's important. Now there's one other thing I want to speak about. And I think this is important is that Lord, you're speaking about your intense desire, even extreme intense desire. And I get what you're saying. And, and, and what I want to share with you is just another perspective or the, the way that Vaishnavas, right? The way that like um, deep, experienced Vaishnavas or, or Bhakti Yogis, they generally won't speak of their own longing as, as being extremely intense. Because generally they're going to see if it was extremely intense, you know, then, then I would be losing interest in everything else, right? Like for instance, in the Nectar Devotion, the book that we read from the preface from earlier, it describes that when, when people reach these higher stages of Bhakti, where it is very intense, then it manifests in, in nine different symptoms, you know. Now, among those nine different sim sim symptoms, one is called virakti. Hmm. Virakti means detachment, complete indifference to the objects of sense gratification, right? You know, mana sunyata, absence of false prestige or pridelessness, to be completely humble and, uh, and entirely free from longing for being shown respect, you know. Um, sum, samukanta, an intense eagerness to achieve the ardent desire for attaining one's desired supreme object, prema. You know, nama gane sadaruchi, uh, an intense thirst arising out of an affection for constantly chanting the holy names. You know, if I'm distracted by other things in life and I get caught up in that and I get upset about this, then the, then the, the bhakti yoga would say, my, my longing isn't quite intense. Now, maybe what's intense is I'm, I'm sick of this world. <laughs> you know, I'm sick of the things of this world, you know, but, but we, we tend to still be caught up in other things. So I'm, I, I absolutely encourage and pursue to pursue this highest of, of aspirations. And you've discovered, you know, the, and, and, and are developing a focus on that very high school. And that's a very beautiful and very rare thing that I applaud, you know, but, but to get there, we're going to have to get to this stage where we're really analyzing, you know, just how deeply intense is our desire or are all we all also kind of caught up in so many other things in this world. And when, when they asked Lord Chaitanya, you know, about love of God, he said, I don't have any love of God. If I do, how could I even be alive right now? You know? So, um, but in any case, very beautiful. And uh, just be careful how you explain it to people. Lord. <laughs> but, but you asked, um, can this be taken too far? Not at all. Keep, keep following that desire, you know, all the way back to, to the Rasa Lila, all the way back to Krishna's uh, pastimes. You're muted. Right? Dude, I you... call it the... You call what? Can you hear me? Yeah. I call what? it the Krishna crazy. Krishna, Krishna crazy. crazy. Krishna crazy. Go a little the, Krishna the crazy. Krishna, cra Krishna crazy. Krishna crazy. Yeah. Because yeah. you get so wrapped up in Krishna that you appear crazy to everybody else. Well, that happens. Happen. We all go through that. Yeah. We all go through that. Our friends, family... <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, when I first, uh, on my way to India, you know, I was really connected with uh, the record company, my partner in uh, Revelation Records. I thought, well, he'll, I mean, Krishna makes so much sense. The whole world will love Krishna. 
<laughs> and so I wrote him these lyrics. I was like sitting in the London temple on the way. And I, I read this lyrics to one of the famous Krishna songs, which is uh, uh, the Lotus Feet. Li just, just listen to this. Pretend you're not at all interested in anything God conscious or Indian or whatever. I wrote these lyrics because I thought they were the, so beautiful. I said, the lotus feet of our spiritual master are the only the way, only we, way. <laughs> we can attain pure devotional service. I bow down to his lotus feet in great awe and reverence. By his grace, one can cross the ocean of material suffering and obtain the mercy of Krishna. My only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. Attachment to his lotus feet is the perfection that fulfills all desires. So I wrote this whole prayer down. I go, I just wrote. I just read the most beautiful prayer in the world. Isn't this the most incredible thing you've ever heard? And he was like, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds really weird to me. So bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. You cross that threshold to fil from philosophy and sort of like meditation and my yoga practice. And then you cross the threshold into Krishna crazy. <laughs> You can't explain it. Okay. Uh, you've been so much in Krishna crazy all these years, Kostuba, that it's, see, you have the beautiful, you can, you can go in, you can go back into the, leave the threshold of Krishna crazy and go back into the regular realm and throw a lifeline for people like myself and no. pull me in. Come on, Raghu, come on in to Krishna crazy. I was like, no. I, I haven't gone crazy enough yet. I, I got to go crazy. the world, Kostuba. Leave me alone. <laughs> You're like, come, Raghunath. Krishna crazy is fun. Get out of here. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, music? Hey, uh, what, we got a meeting coming up, right? Uh, Bhakti Recovery meeting. The Zoom link is being shared. I think the Zoom link may be different this week than it normally is because uh, Jeeva's on the road. It's on Nancy Rothman's. I just got a message from them. Gwen says, hey, Raghu, hope all is well. Could you please announce that today's meeting will be on Nancy's Zoom because I am flying home from Greece today and will have no internet. So we have a whole Krishna recovery program. It's a bhakti related recovery program that's available on our Patreon account. If you're listening to this on Facebook and you're new to the, all this, this is a community supported podcast. Um, people contribute on our patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. And then we have, it opens you into a secret passageway where there's a huge vaulted room filled with yoga classes and workshops and 12 step recovery groups and message boards and people talking all day about their spiritual life, et cetera. Check that out. Thanks for everybody for joining us. And now we do our favorite part of the day. We take our namaste and start to make our namaste clap. Bring our hands in the air like you don't care about the material world. <laughs> you walk through You're that crazy. threshold and join Kostuba <laughs> in Krishna Crazy Land. You meet me and Laura there. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us on Zoom. We had a huge posse today. About a 90 people. Katie Wickoff, Jimmy G, Hari Das. You know who you are, Harry Das. Liam Conway, Roman Rogner from Prague, Elizabeth Schubert, I see you from Boston. Michelle Berger, I think I'm gonna see her today. Hair mustache, hair mustachio. Wenke G, 